So if you've got your Bibles, if you want to turn to Revelations chapter 3, we will be looking at another one of the churches tonight. Uh, we will be looking at probably what would be considered the most controversial of these churches just because of one particular word that's in the letter. And we will look at that more in depth. Um, but just to look back where we have been so far, we've looked at Ephesus and Sardis and the religious or legalistic spirit and the liberal spirit that was in those churches. We looked at Pergamum and Thyatira and the false teachers, false prophets that the Jezebel spirit brought in and the Ahab spirits that let those spirits come into the church. So tonight as we look at Laodicea, we're going to look at another spirit, one that's probably not quite as well known. But we're going to get to get to know it, get familiar with it so that we know how to defend against it. But I just want to open up and I just want to ask, has anybody ever used any icy hot? Icy hot, like sore muscle stuff, it's good stuff. And if you're, you're really varsity level, you, you've upgraded to Tiger Balm, which is in a little bitty thing, and it gets way hotter than Icy Hot. But Icy Hot starts cold, and it gets hot, right? So you get two for one. But there is a weird transition period in there that it's not really cold, but it's not really hot. It doesn't stay there for very long, but it is there. But it is interesting how even that has stages. And we're going to look at how Laodicea is said to have a weird in-between stage like that. So in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14, is where we find the letter to Laodicea. And it says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot, or excuse me, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those who I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So right off the bat, we see one thing really interesting with this church. There's no commendation. Jesus doesn't say anything good about this church. And if you just think about that, like we've looked at other churches that had false prophets and false teachers, religious and liberals, and they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But Jesus was still able to find something good to say about those churches. But not Laodicea. Which is very interesting. It's like, wow. That is very hard 
shot, if you think about it. Like, nothing you are doing is good. They did, however, have a rebuke. In verses 15 through 17, it says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. So that's quite the list there. And I told you there was one word that made this particular church uh, a little different. And that's that word in verse 16 that says, you are lukewarm. None of the other churches had that word. That word does not appear anywhere else in the Bible except about this one church. So if it only appears once, it must be important, right? So if we take verse 15, and we'll break this section down. It says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So Jesus doesn't want them to be in the middle. You either need to be cold or you need to be hot. If you're cold, you have chosen your side. You don't want anything to do with Jesus. Just leave me alone. I don't want nothing to do with that. I'm going to go do my own thing. If you're hot, then you're saying, I want to be on Team Jesus. I want to do everything I can. I'm going to praise the Lord every chance I get. I'm going to do everything that he asks of me and be as obedient as possible. And in Second Peter 2.21 it says, For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. So, you're either cold or you're hot. If you're hot, you need to stay hot. If you're cold and you want to go to hot, that's fine. Just don't go back. The verse 17 says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. We can see in John chapter 9, verses 39 through 41, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. For some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. What Jesus is talking about is spiritual blindness. They, the Pharisees weren't physically blind. But they thought they were righteous. They thought they were doing everything right. But Jesus reminded them real quick, no, you're not, because you're not following me. You don't believe in me. You don't love me. We see in the Scripture where he even tells them, you're trying to kill me. So they're spiritually blind, just like the folks here in Laodicea. They think they're fine. They think everything is hunky-dory and there's no big deal. But that is, couldn't be anything further from the truth. And because of that, trying to get folks that are in that mindset turned back around and going to Jesus, some of them will, but some of them won't. Some of them will harden their heart even more. And you can see that all the way back in the Old Testament when Moses and Aaron were trying to get the Israelites set free from the Egyptians. And it said that they went to, the, to Pharaoh 
told him what the Lord said, and then it said, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But it was the love of the Lord because he was trying to get him to turn around and see, like, if you'll just let my people go, you're good. I'll leave you alone. But he didn't. He hardened his heart towards that love. And that's what he's talking about here in John 9. Some of you, some of the people, will harden their hearts towards the Lord even more. And they won't turn around. So that just leaves us with verse 16. And dealing with this word, lukewarm. It says, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For clarification on that, we can go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. It says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And... As I was studying for this, a lot of the different commentaries that I read on it range all over the place because people want to look at this word lukewarm from a different angle. I think lukewarm was chosen on purpose. I don't think it's a coincidence because lukewarm indicates that you were either cold and you started to heat up so you know a little bit now, or you were hot and you've started to cool down, meaning you knew a lot, but you're forgetting it. You're dismissing it. You're not paying any attention to it anymore. I think that word was chosen on purpose by Jesus. So what's the resolution? How do they fix it? We see that in Revelations 3, verses 18 and 19. It says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those who I'm, who, excuse me, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Again, we see repent. We've seen that throughout the other four churches that we've looked at. We see it here. So being lukewarm, you're not on fire for Jesus anymore. You've started to cool down. You've quenched the Spirit enough to where that fire is dying down in you is a sin because he says right here to repent. But all these things that he lists here, Buying the gold from us. Buying the salve. We can't buy that with earthly money. That only comes through repentance. That's how we buy that. In Matthew 13, 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy... He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What we have waiting for us in heaven is way better than anything here. And once we realize that, we should pay no mind to what we have here. Earthly things, sure, we we need food, we need shelter, we need things to live. But if it came down to it, to choose the stuff here on earth or following the Lord so that I can partake in my heavenly treasure, we need to choose that every time. And we will only choose that if we're still hot, if we're still on fire. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3 says, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. 
Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me, hear that your soul may live. And I will make you make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Again, in this passage, he's asking us to come and buy things. But there's no price. The price isn't an earthly monetary price. The price is our obedience. The price is our love and us devoting our lives to him. That's the price. But we get so much more in return. We get an everlasting life that is way better than anything that we can possibly imagine. And when we surrender to Him, through His grace is how we get these. So, those who can overcome, what do they get? What's the reward? It says, Behold... I stand at the door and knock, and this is in Revelation 3, verses 20 and 21. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. That sounds pretty good. I like that. I would love to have supper with Jesus. That would just blow my mind. And then on top of that, to sit down on the throne with him, like, oh, like, whoo, that would just be absolutely amazing. But just like with the other churches, we won't see these rewards here on earth. These are rewards that we get once we get to heaven. In 2 Timothy 2.12, Paul tells Timothy that if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So Paul already kind of knew that that's how things go because he was telling Timothy, if we endure, if we overcome the things of this world, if we continue to be obedient to Jesus, that we will reign with him. There's a quote by John Wesley. It says, What one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. The generation of this church in Laodicea that's going lukewarm They're starting to tolerate things that God doesn't tolerate. God knows how bad and how horrible that is because the next generation is just going to think that that's normal. That's how you do it. They're going to start to tolerate more. Then this church will end up like the other four churches that we've talked about because lukewarm is how it starts. Typically, you don't just go zero to a hundred with a church full of Jezebels and Ahabs and religious people and all this. It starts slow. And it may take a couple of generations. It may take three or four. just depends on how the particular spirit here, how fast it wants to work. But it does get there. And I had asked a question this past Sunday, and it never even dawned on me until after after that sermon. I had asked, if God's Word doesn't excite you, move you, or make you want to tell everyone, what are you ashamed of? And I, I told you, I can't answer that. That's something that only you can answer. My shame, my sin, is on me. 
unless I share it with everybody, nobody could say, oh, well, you're ashamed of this or you're ashamed of that. The same with with y'all. But what are you ashamed of? It didn't click, like I said, until after that sermon. The particular spirit that's at work here in Laodicea loves to make us feel ashamed. And as I started to study this particular spirit to see how it worked, I found it very hard to just make a few bullet points and explain everything that somebody might need to know. We see way more examples and we hear more preachers talking about the Ahab and Jezebel spirit, the religious spirit, the the legalistics and the liberals and all this. But you don't hear much about this one. So, since I couldn't really make a few bullet points to explain it, I wrote it out in essay form. Um, it's a couple of pages, so if y'all will just bear with me. I want to read through this because I think this really captures the essence of this spirit, if you will, and how it works. Acedia. It is a spirit not often spoken about, and he prefers it that way. This is the spirit who specializes in mediocrity and comfort. This spirit is also known as the noonday demon. His goal is to make sure we never progress in the spiritual life, and fail to achieve the greatness for which we are created. To put it another way, acedia is the spirit that whispers in our ear, that's too hard, or someone like you could never be holy. There are two main ways this, the spirit of acedia immobilizes us. First, by dredging up sins from our past to make us ashamed and resentful. Acedia is constantly reminding us of how we messed up in high school or college. All the sins we committed and the stupid mistakes that we made. The other weapon in his arsenal is to make us unnecessarily anxious about future events. Our minds become consumed with concerns about things that haven't even happened. What if my child grows up and gets in trouble? What if people find out what I've done? What if I don't get the job that I applied for? What if my spouse cheats on me? What if? What if? What if? We can spend hours trapped in our own minds, wasting energy, worrying about things, that are not even real. The mental gymnastics makes us mentally and spiritually fatigued, leading to exhaustion and irritability. Second, after he has tempted us with shame about our past or or anxiety about our future, he then offers an escape. These escapes can take many forms. Technology, Netflix, Social media, pornography, alcohol, drugs, our career, etc., etc. The list goes on and on. Acedia offers all these things as a means of distracting us from God and focuses, focusing us on our wounds, our lack of self-worth, and our fears. In the end, we are left empty. As we return to the thoughts we try to avoid, and the vicious cycle starts all over again. Another note about the spirit of Acedia is that he will do all in his power to make us comfortable through the escapes that he tempts us with. To keep us from realizing our God-given gifts and drawing closer to God. He will work hard to convince us that we are just fine as we are. And there is no need to be challenged or changed in any way. The spirit of Acedia does not mind stagnant or lukewarm Christians, but he hates growing ones. 
He is content that you go to church every Sunday, but not pay attention. If you are simply going through the motions, he has won. You are out of the game. People of routine are not a threat to Satan. It is the people who are striving to improve, learn, and change that are most dangerous to the reign of evil. We need to actively engage in the church with each other and God as we constantly seek to grow. Acedia stands at the root of not only underliving life, but of wasting life. Namely, wasting our talents and potential to develop them to make a positive difference in the world. While other sins require us to temper our passions and exercise self-control, acedia is the opposite. It is the lack of any type of passion for God and what He is doing because we are so distracted and focused on our own wounds, lack of self-worth, and fears. Due to that lack, a person will eventually get to the point where they don't care that they don't care. Once someone hits that point, they are just going through the motions. They show up for church on Sunday, but the rest of the week they live like unbelievers, not even acknowledging God or that they are a Christian. The world then has a tainted view of what it means to be a Christian. And true Christians that are seeking God see this as very confusing. Those seeking God start to have thoughts like, why am I doing all this when it doesn't seem necessary? They can just show up for church and then live however they want. Thoughts like those are what gives Acedia a foothold in our lives. Then before we know it, we are lukewarm at best, like the people of Laodicea. But we do see in the Bible another type of people listed. Scoffers. Acedia will use those people to gain a foothold in our lives as well. When we are confronted by a scoffer, They will typically say all sorts of nasty and vile things about us or our faith in God. If we entertain those thoughts, that is just one more way for Acedia to get into our head and wreak havoc. In 2 Peter 3, verse 3, Peter talks about scoffers coming in the last days and that they will follow their own sinful desires. Scoffers have their own evil spirits to deal with, but we cannot let them open the door to us for Acedia to get in. And while we may not see this specific spirit named in the Bible, we see where it is working. In Ezekiel 16.49, We see God telling us of Sodom and how they had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease. These are all things that Laodicea had as well. Remember, comfort is one of the things that the spirit of Acedia offers us. And both Sodom and Laodicea had plenty of comfort. In Psalms 91 verse 6, the psalmist specifically calls out the destruction that wastes at noonday in reference to this spirit. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 11, Paul gives a warning about idleness and refers to these people as busybodies. This idleness is a distraction from what God has called us to do, from the good works that God has prepared for us in advance. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, Paul lists the last sign of a godless person. It reads, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Paul is warning Timothy about the people who are being controlled by the spirit of Acedia. They appear to be godly since they go to church, but they don't really live the life that they should. 
goals of this spirit are to keep our minds distracted by any means possible so that we put our spiritual blinders on and just go through the motions while seeking comfort and pleasure instead of our God-given calling. If you find yourself saying, I don't have enough time, I'm too tired, I just don't feel like dot, 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 and then you end those sentences with anything like to study God's Word, to pray, to build relationships with God's people, or build God's kingdom in general. You may have been given a lot of distractions from Assyria. We have to remember what God says in Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Lord will not have us too busy, too tired, or too depressed from the work He has for us. He will provide all the time, energy, confidence, and anything else we need to complete the good works that He has prepared for us. If we just can't seem to find the time, the energy, the motivation, or anything else, we are probably occupied with distractions from Assyria and not the works that God has for us. In Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, Jesus gives us the parable of the weeds. In these verses, we see that it is the enemy who sows the weeds amongst the wheat. But this only happens after the servants fall asleep. This parable highlights how dangerous it can be for Christians to fall asleep or to put on their spiritual blinders. And this is exactly what Asidia wants, is for us to become so distracted that we put on our blinders or just fall asleep completely so that the other evil spirits can invade our homes and our church. This is why Jesus had no commendation for Laodicea. He was trying to wake them up and help them see what was going on. The other churches at Ephesus, Sardis, Thyatira, and Pergamum had already gone through this particular season, put on their blinders, and allowed the other spirits to take over their churches. Acedia may be the least well-known, but is usually the spirit on the front lines of the war getting us to put our blinders on and allow the other spirits to move in. Or put more simply, let the weeds be sown. Luke 21, 34 through 36. In this passage, Jesus is talking about the end times. The times that we live in now. He says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares for this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus is warning us against this spirit. The word dissipation, when I read this, jumped out at me. Dissipation means the squandering of money, energy, or resources, which is exactly what Acedia gets us to do. <coughs> Excuse me. But as we see, Jesus tells us to stay awake. Don't let that fire go out. So how do we prevent this? Because that was 
quite the description of this particular spirit. How do we prevent this spirit from pushing us that far? <clears throat> In Luke twelve thirty six, it says, And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. 2 Timothy 1, 6 says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Matthew three eleven says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Folks, you've got to keep that fire burning. You cannot let it go out. You cannot quench the Holy Spirit. If you do, then Laodicea is where you should reside. Because quenching the Spirit, quenching that fire, not fanning it into flame, not constantly seeking God, not constantly exercising the gifts that He's given you, is how you start to become lukewarm. When you start looking at things like, I'll get to that later. Oh, it's just one Sunday that I miss. I'll be all right. Those things start to build. The next thing you know, you haven't been to church in months. You haven't visited with any of God's children for months. So there was another quote that I ran across in all this by E.M. Bounds. It says, God requires to be represented by a fiery church. Two things are intolerable to him, insincerity and lukewarmness. Folks, lukewarm will not get you into heaven. Jesus says it plainly. He will spit you out of his mouth. Are you lukewarm? Or are you headed in that direction? The main theme that we've been saying is to use God's word as a mirror so that we can see what's going on in our lives. We need to do that. We need to do that before it's too late. Are you fanning the flame? Are you constantly seeking God? Are you constantly looking for every opportunity to use your gifts to His glory? Stop making excuses. Take off your blinders and experience the love and the mercy and grace of God. And... With that, I will close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this evening, and we just want to thank you again, Lord, for this time that you've given us. We thank you again for being here with us and leading us through your word and helping us to understand it and helping us to see all the things that you wanted us to. And Lord, we just ask that as we go through the rest of our lives that you Help us to remember this. Help us to remember this church as an example of what not to do. And help us to always be fanning that flame that you put in us, Lord. Help us to always have that desire to grow as your child. To grow closer to you. And to always live as you want us to live, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, that as we go through the rest of our week, that you just watch over everyone here and protect them and lead them, Lord, in your will and just help them to continue to grow and help them to fan their flames in the fire, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.